Are you trying to transition from an? Uh, okay, are you trying to transition from one role to QA role, and are you also trying to um, just grow your career? So just let me know what you currently do as an in. Hello, sorry, we can't hear you. We need to yeah, Miriam, you're muted. Um, you might want to unmute. We actually think you have done that already. You have moved. Hi, Miriam. I don't know if you can hear me, but you're muted. Barack, kindly omit. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we yes. can. All right, sorry. Um, I don't know how that happened. Apologies, guys. So um, I was just doing an introduction before I went mute on what today is going to be about. So I was going over the agenda on what we're going to be talking about today. Introduce myself, um, difference between Agile and Scrum, um, what is SDLC itself, and also the role of QA in each of those phases, and why I feel QA is the PM's as now. Then we go over to the um, Q&A session. So briefly about me, my name is Miriam Yunus. Um, my superpower, I'm a mom, uh, a wife, um, I'm a product management professional, and I've been a product manager for the past five years. Um, but professionally, I've been working for over seven years. Um, I'm business centric and I'm user centric as well, which means um, I've had the opportunity of working with different organizations from entertainment to payment to um, outsourcing development company to e-learning which I'm currently in, in ULSN. So I've worked with organizations like Ebony Light, our uh, place, I've worked with Female Cinemas, Summit Tech Company Limited, Loop Me, ULSN, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I've um, worked on products around entertainment, payment, um, learning, um, NGO, non-governmental organizations. And I love human capacity building, so I volunteer a lot. Um, and I'm also a Scrum Master, which means as a product manager, sometimes I also serve in the capacity of a Scrum Master for my team, if that team doesn't have a Scrum Master. So onto the order of the day, what is Agile and what is Scrum? So Agile to me, I would explain this in, in as simple term as I can. I feel Scrum is more of a subset of Agile. Scrum is how we implement Agile. But let me explain Agile first, then I'll explain Scrum. So Agile is a methodology in a way of managing the products by breaking it into several phases. Before now, we had so many methodologies that people use in, um, in um, working on projects or 
effectively initiating product and co project and completing them. Um, we had waterfall model, we have the V model, we have a lot of models, but they all had limitations. And the first one was it re there was not enough um, collaboration. It doesn't, um, it, some of those um, also methodology don't accept um, changes early and they don't also um, enable feedback early. So that is the first thing that Agile came to solve. One, uh, collaboration, let the team collaborate with the product across team, across cross, cross um, distributed systems, and also let them get feedback early from both the product manager, the business owner, from the users. And also, there's also continuous improvement of the product. And that is why Agile is still currently one of the best methodology right now that you can use for any project. And the beauty of Agile is that you don't really have to use it for only software development. You can use it for building your house, um, creating a physical product, creating um, any project at all, any project, even, if, even in your career as a key professional, you can use Agile. Just break it into actionable goals and track it and then evaluate yourself as you trans as you move ahead. Okay, these are the things I want to achieve in 10 years. I've broken it down to five years, one year. And then am I making them? What are the things I need to change? You collaborate, you ask questions, you get people engaged in it. And also once the work begins, team circle through a process of planning, executing, testing, evaluating, and all the steps that involves in Agile methodology. Now, Scrum is actually the way we implement Agile in such a way that we get to check all this feedback early, collaborate early, um, working software over documentation, continuous delivery and all that. So Scrum is a framework that helps teams work together. So it is, um, people mistake it for Agile, but it is not Agile. It is just the way we help, we, we are able to implement Agile effectively. So it describes a set of meeting tools and roles that um, you need to uh, encompass in the software development lifecycle. So you'd have head of daily standups, you would have head of sprint planning, you'd have head of backlog grooming, sprint retrospective. So I'll just um, explain this briefly before I go into the main course of the day. So backlog grooming is you've already identified all everything you need to build, right? And you've broken them into epic tags and um, stories, right? So epic is a chunk of work you want to do. Tax uh, is a um, story is a breakdown of that work into actionable components, milestones, and then tax is the minimum amount of work that needs to be completed for the story to be complete, for the story to start. And then um, daily standups is where we get updates every day from each of the team members. So team members are product managers, software engineers. We have um, front end, back end, security, DevOps, and a whole lot of them, and QA as well. And then the daily standup is just let us know the progress. What did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? And do you have any blocker? And the sprint retro is at the end of the two week sprint. So different teams run different sprints. Some run one week sprint, some run two week sprint, some run four week sprint. But the most um, advisable and recommended sprint length is two week sprint. So at the end of the sprint, um, which is a length of time is um, um, cycle work should um, be broken into. That's what a sprint is. You also evaluate, okay, at the end of the sprint, we said we're going to complete 10 tasks, but we've only been able to complete five tasks. Why is that? What can we use to do to improve this process better? And then you circle around again, you start the sprint again, and then you evaluate at the end of each sprint. There's also um, release retrospective where you check, okay, the things we released, did anything break? What are the things we could have done better? What are the things we didn't do? And stuff like that. There's a lot of things around Scrum. So I'll just advise as a QA, you read more on it and Agile, because it is really, really broad. And I don't want to digress too much from the course of the day. The next thing I'll be talking about is what is software development life cycle is, is itself. So these are different phases that the software product has to go through to um, from the beginning of ideation to the release. So um, you have an idea, let's say, for example, I want to build a product like WhatsApp. WhatsApp didn't just start, right? Someone thought of it, someone thought, okay, how do I get people to communicate without needing BBM or buying devices, just using their mobile phone numbers and get them to talk real time, get them to share moments, get them to share um, files, um, like voice um, recordings and all. 
So all those things add and it was an idea before someone brought it to light. So on the ideation stage, you that is where you brainstorm the idea. Is this thing even realistic? Is it feasible? Is it doable? If it is doable, how do we get it? What our who our target audience and all this is where you brainstorm to be sure that that's you are actually addressing the problem you need to solve. And the next phase is now the requirement gathering stage. This is my own personal territory as a product manager. This is where um, we go to, we, we reach out to the users, to the um, both the internal and external users, internal users and primary and secondary users. Internal users are people that we use the application within the system, ecosystem of which you're building it for. And external users are those that will use it outside the system. Also primary users are the target users of that app. Now, um, for our own learning, uh, my company, ULSN, our app, are out, we have customers. Our customers are the parents, people that buy this, and then we have our target users who are the students that are actually going to use the app. But we all know that it's not the student that will pay for the app or pay for the subscription, but they are actually our target users. So that means we have to, whatever we are building, we have to cater for the customers that are buying and the users that are going to, going, also going to use the app. Also understand where is our target market, are we staying in Nigeria? Are we staying in Africa? And all. So, who are these age ranges we want to attract? Um, we want to attract primary students, secondary school students, even university students, right? So, you. Uh, this is where all the requirements is labeled. So, you first of all come start with your eye level requirements, then break it down to actionable um, requirement that engineers can easily understand. Then the design stage. This is where the UI UX designers come in, where they. Um, everything you've talked about in the requirement, then they visualize it. So the first thing before this stage is the wireframing. This is where you sketch out um, like the structure of what the uh, design is going to look like. And then the designers um, take this and make it into high definition mock-up designs that are appealing to your eyes, that are pretty to look at. And then they also um, work on, if you are on login, after you log in successfully, what is the next thing you should see? That is UI UX. That is, um, user interface and user experience. So as uh, a primary school user, what are the personas of these users? Uh, what are the things um, we should cater for? The way you build apps for someone that is 25, 26, 30 years and adult is not the same way you build for a teenager and definitely not the same way you build for a baby like a kid. Um, if you know Coco Melon very well, you will know the colors are popping in your face and that's because it is targeted at babies because they wanted to attract them. Even the sounds are uh, oratory. They wanted to engage the kids, um, the cartoon characters. So all of these things would have gone into the requirement and design stages to get things that will actually attract the target audience. Um, development is where the actual work is done. This is where the engineers um, define the requirements, both the logic and the design and put it into action. This is where that fine UI you've seen, that fine design that uh, Miriam has designed is now being developed. And now when you click a button, you see the next thing, you can see animations moving. This is where the actual work is done. And then the testing stage is where QA comes in fully. I'll go back, to, I'll come back to this later. So this is where QA checks that we're evaluating the quality of the product we want to release. Is it, um, is it effective? Is it efficient? Is it built right? Did you build the right product and did you build it the right way? So we check um, the quality of everything. Then we deploy. Um, if you want to deploy it to the web or to the client apps, iOS, Android, web app, uh, Microsoft and all. So you deploy it, you prepare it, you run, you run tests and all that. Then after it is done, you maintain it. Now, ideally in software development lifecycle, anywhere you see it, you see the right testing as one phase. But to me, QA is involved from the beginning to the end. So right now in Agile, what we do is we get feedback early and that is by getting all the team members in the brainstorming session. And I've realized over the course of my five years career that QA insight is valuable from the beginning to the end. I've had cases when um, I've created a requirement that was so lo looking so beautiful, like I've cracked everything that needs to be crackable. And then QA just comes, uh, Miriam, um, you didn't think about this dependency because right now this is what we have. If you want to do this, we currently don't have the infrastructure to, to, to take it on or you didn't think about this particular user or, okay, Miriam, if this thing happens, 
what happens, right? So QA helps us get insights early because and they also help us flesh out our requirements, they help, help us flesh out the quality of our requirements. So yes, product managers are great managers, but they also need every other's input to be awesome managers. So getting their feedback early, doing even the requirement stage helps you know, fine tune your requirement because one, it helps them plan, it helps them create a test plan early. Now, if I'm building a product for, for one of the current um, features we released on your lesson is a multiplayer quiz. We got feedback early on how that is going to go. We just wanted people to play a game and we've already created the requirement. They will now realize, okay, what if um, I also want to play with my friend and what if, how do I know that the next level is higher than the other one? So the QA came with different insights, different case scenarios that even higher as a PM, the engineers did not even think of. And then because the QA also in that capacity says as a user and as a critical. So they critique what you're building and they also put understand the user's pain point. Yes, as a PM, you have to understand that, but as the QA, QA are not, um, I'm looking for the right word, they are neutral. They just want you to build the right thing, the right way for the right users and ensure that these users are getting value for what they are learning or what they are, the product you are building. In the design, yes, also QA is crucial in design. I've had um, instances where we created um, design that was looking so beautiful. And then QA will be like, you people know that you're actually building for cute children, right? This color is not as attractive or this color is not popping or it is not bold enough. It is not making a statement piece. Because we have allowed ups, they have up to us, the person them involved early has helped them create a test plan. They already know how the end-to-end -end process of the testing is going to go. The end-to-end -end process of the deployment is going to go. They also plan deployment releases. They plan so many things for us to get things out really, really fast. And then the testing part, okay, the work is done. They check it. Um, does this feature meet all the acceptance criteria that was listed? And also, does it meet the conformance of what the app is? And after we are, even before deployment, before deployment, we check that that app is ready to go. Nothing is breaking. So we have different iteration of staging. We set first of the staging. We do our first test there. Then UAT, we do user acceptance testing. Then um, the final deployment checks. Then we now do another round of post-deployment checks to ensure this thing we deployed, hope it did not break anything. Hope it is still seamless as when we're testing it at every stage. And maintenance, actually, I want to like to you, QA app is very, very crucial in maintenance. I've had cases where even things we've tested perfectly, that so there are some case scenarios that you would not even know until it is on live environment or until people start using it. There are times when it involves um, um, the number of traffic that the app can take. Let's say when you are creating the database, you only catered for 1,000 users. But when you deploy, your app is so awesome, so much that 20,000 users are trying to get into it at the same time. So QA has to be on call, on check to ensure that um, we are doing um, stress testing, we are doing page performance testing. I'm sorry, as a PM, I have to know all this. And as a QA, you also have to, you are partially also a product manager in your own right, because you are planning testing from the beginning of the product life till the end of that product life. You're checking every day that is this thing working right and get any loopholes. And there also, we also have Q, QA, um, QA in the security spectrum. People that are trying to check, are people trying to penetrate into our system? Are people are trying to ask us, do we have anything catered for if anything happens? They ask, help us um, define our risk. They help us ensure that we are maintaining. So um, one of the things I forgot to mention during Scrum was um, creating a user story. A user story is a minute number of um, 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 results that a, tax, a, a, um, a feature is supposed to achieve. So it usually comes with the user story, the acceptance criteria, uh, sometimes the description as well of, of what the engineer is supposed to do. Underneath that as well, there's also going to be a um, description for the QA to test, in what environment they should test, in what persona they should test, and assumptions that you've made while creating. Now, imagine creating that and not having your QA involved from the outset, that you didn't get them involved in any of the planning. It means that you keep going back to refining your requirements. You keep going back to changing user stories. It means that you are giving the engineers a lot of work. Um, trying to fix the things that you as a PM are broken. So the PMs are crucial in from brainstorming 
So the entire life cycle of the product, as long as that product is still in the market, the QA is crucial, crucial for it. I have my QAs that is checking all of the clients apps every day, every minute of every day. Um, we have we, every minute of health checks, every minute of penetration testing is being done every day. So to me, QA, and that was what I mentioned in my agenda, QA is actually our arsenal. Um, and the reason I said that is that even after the QA is done, I know as a PM, we are the ones that accept um, the requirement when it is passed. But let me tell you, if the QA tells us that that app is not going live, we start crying because we know it is not going live. Because if anything goes um, out of order, they'll just tell us, we told you it was not going, and you guys went, we're out of it. And when they give us, they give us the highest level of trust. They give us the highest level of trust on the quality of products we are bringing out. So if the QA is telling me, Miriam, this thing is okay for five people, but once it is 20 people, it will not work. I know it's telling me this thing is critical. You need to go back to the drawing board or this thing will not fly. And the fact that QA are also very, very crucial to the top management in such a way that if QA is telling us that this delivery date is good, but this thing is not good enough, we don't have this confidence level for us to release this out. It means that we are not done and the work continues. As much as the PM also have power in code, UQA are actually more powerful than us, the, the PMs, because I still remember today I had a case of that. I needed the office done, and my QA came to me, Miriam, we know you need this done, but you also know that we already checked the data that this doesn't affect a high percentage of our users. It can still go as an auto fix because we still need to add it to the release. I was like, God. I don't really like you very much right now, but I have to listen to him because it makes sense. And that is why they are like our voice of reasoning as a PM, because we get so um, engrossed in the product we're trying to build that we don't actually, we want to beat time, we want to manage our resources that they are the ones that are so neutral that brings us back in check, back in check to, to say, okay, we know you are trying to meet deadline. We know you're trying to satisfy your customer, but are we sure that whenever we release this, the same customer you're trying to satisfy won't break our head or we won't lose them because we are shipping wrong or inconsistent or buggy application of features. So that is how important QA is and the software development life cycle. They are crucial. You guys are like our lifeline. Take it from me anywhere you go. Um, so role of QA in SDLC. Um, I've, tried, I've mentioned that everywhere in that um, last slide, but this is just a slide to just point us in it. So they are, your main role is quality assurance. No matter how you grow high and uh, ahead in the hierarchy or your trajectory, your main role is always going to be quality assurance. Are we building the product the right way? Are we building the product right? Is this product efficient? Is it for the right category of users it was supposed to be built for? Supposed to be built for? So you are focused on improving the software development process and also helping us pre prevent defects in production. You are also, helping us ensure we are doing things the right way. You are also trying to create test summary for us. So at the end of each of the releases, the QA team that I currently work with give us like a um, confidence level of these are the test summary of everything we did. This is the summary, the reports on the post deployment checks. So they help us know, okay, last time we did the release, we had 20 bug, bug or 20 defects. Now that we did the release, we have 10. You understand, it helps us improve every time as we make release product. And then it also helps us, you guys also help us create test strategy um, based on the project requirements, schedules, estimations, and the resources. You also help us collaborate on the development team. They're actually, they're actually closer to the development team than the product manager. And yes, the developers don't really like QAs, but I realize that they've learned to work and enhance to achieve the same goal. And the QA also helps us um, uncover vulnerabilities in the system. It might be in the system, it might be in the DB, it might be in the product itself. It might even sometimes be in our target market or our target audience. So the QAs are kind of everything we need to get things rolling. There are a lot of other roles that uh, QA um, is involved in the, in the SDLC, but this is just some of them because this is a 30 minute webinar, so we can have time for enough questions. Um, and just, you guys are so vital in the growth and trajectory of any product. So that's all for me. Um, I'm open to questions and answers. Yeah, okay. um, thank you, Miriam, for that um, presentation.
sorry, I'm just um, in order to ask this question because it, um, it has been on my mind ever since um, the question of the day actually pop up from our WhatsApp group. And uh, I need me to just uh, bring back the question to your hearing so you can actually throw more light on it because. Um, sorry, so there's too much background noise on your end, so I can barely make out what you're saying. Mm -hmm. How about now? Can you hear me now? Is it better um, now? Now, do you mind dropping your question on the chats so I can really okay. follow the background noise? Is, um, is, is, is it better now? Is it, is it better now? Yes, it's better now. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yeah. I do your question. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question from um, goes does that um, it says um, a product was created and deployed to meet a major need of end users. This was satisfied mm -hmm. to go live, and upon its release, there were a lot of issues, defects raised from engaging. With the product by customers. These were major bugs that can kill a product. That is, users not likely to visit or recommend the product to anyone. So the question is um, who is to be held responsible for this defect oversight? A QA team, B product um, slash um, project manager, C back end engineer, D front end engineer, then E 